advocacy team, and I'd like to welcome you all today. Um, I ask you to join me in thanking uh, our sponsor, Prevea, for this wonderful uh, event. Uh, the Elks Club. <laughs> the Elks Club for this fine meal and their facility. And then our business advocacy team for the programming that you're about to have today. Um, at this time, could I have all our business advocacy team members raise your hands? Um, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, feel free to write them on the cards you'll find at your table, or reach out to any of those people who raised their hands, um, and they are the individuals that are on our advocacy team. <coughs> Today we are here to learn about the 2015 Wisconsin State Budget. Our speaker is Representative John Nygren. He is married with three children. He has worked for 18 years in the restaurant industry as a manager, district manager, and director of um, operations before becoming a co-owner of a restaurant. In 1998, he began his career in financial services and continues his work with the Great Lakes Financial Management Group. Along his way, commitment to community can be mapped by his dedication to the JCs, the Kiwanis, Marionette County Republican Party, the Marionette Recreation Board, and the Marionette Elks Club. You're feeling really welcomed here with the giant elk on the back wall, right? Yeah. Good job. Represent, Representative Nygren is currently serving the people of the Northwest Wisconsin for the fourth term in the State Assembly. Please welcome Representative John Nygren. I've got my staff update that I'm getting older, I'm actually in my fifth term, so in the, in the uh, state legislature. Time, time flies and you're having fun. Um, thank you, first of all, for the opportunity to, to be here. Um, appreciate the invitation. Uh, being in the state legislature, it was mentioned, uh, you know, my work in JCs and the mayor and I were talking, uh, commiserating about old JC times. That, uh, I was actually the state president, national president of the organization, and especially the, when I was a state president back in the 90s, loved tra traveling the state, and you'd get to towns, you know, oftentimes little, much littler towns than Sheboygan, that for no other reason would you get there and, and then to, uh, you know, visit and, and meet with people who are doing some great things, but learn how special this, this state really is, and actually Sheboygan was one of our, our, our regular stops, and it's always, it's always good to be back with you. Um, the, just a little bit of update uh, where we're at in the process of the, the, the budget, uh, which is my main role in the assembly you know, as co-chairman of the Joint Finance Committee. We deal with pretty much everything from taxes and then revenues to you know, how we're going to spend our dollars uh, in, the, in the state. Uh, this is my second uh, budget doing that, it, but one of the things I learned is, is how few people actually understand the process that we actually go through, which is pretty unique. Uh, Joint Finance Committee in Wisconsin is considered one of the most powerful committees in the, in the country uh, from a leg state legislative process because we have the ability to make pretty uh, big decisions on behalf of you. Uh, I think most people look at the uh, governor's proposal as being, uh, you know, the end all be all. We're just going to rubber stamp whatever the governor says, whether he's of our, he or she is of our party or not. Uh, and that simply is not the way the process works, and that's not what will end up happening in this case either. Um, so the governor proposes the budget this week, this year he did it about uh, two weeks early. He proposed it in the beginning of February and uh, introduces it in, uh, in a speech to the, the joint uh, convention of the uh, both assembly and the Senate. And uh, at that point in time, it is in, in statute language, and for a couple weeks, the Fiscal Bureau, who is a nonpartisan agency that works on behalf of the legislature, uh, does delves into it and provides a lot of research uh, and you know more common lang uh, language for um, for legislators to be able to learn a little bit more about what's in the proposal. And then after. Uh, that is done, then we begin to have agency briefings where we bring all the different agencies before the Joint Finance Committee and begin to ask questions that are obviously important to our constituents and important to us as legislators. Uh, so that process already <coughs> taken place as well, and then that is followed up by uh, public hearings. We had four of them uh, throughout the state where, once again, this is, this is kind of unique to Wisconsin. We go on the road and we listen.
listen to public the public and, and uh, get an opportunity to hear what you have to say about the governor's uh, proposed budget. So the four different locations that we uh, that we use this year were brilliant, not not too far away, um, Milwaukee, Rice Lake, and Reedsburg. Try to do a, some uh, geographical. Uh, uh, variation from budget to budget to be able to get a true understanding of the different uh, concerns of the whole state, not just uh, maybe Madison or Milwaukee. Um, it's important to have input from everyone. So during those four uh, sessions, we had we heard from over 1,200 people uh, that came and, and testified. They each get two minutes uh, to testify in front of the uh, the body, and it's a it's a legislative hearing just outside of Madison. Uh, those have now concluded. In addition to those public hearings, uh, the Assembly Republicans uh, that I can speak for, um, we additionally had over a hundred listening sessions dealing with the governor's budget uh, ourselves. I had I had three of them in my area, which have concluded. Uh, so I mean, really, the, the public input and potential for input on on the budget is is pretty significant. In addition to that, of course, I do have opportunities like this all the time to hear what uh, people have to say. Um, so the process now uh, is the we will be going into executive session beginning next week, tax day, April fifteenth, will be our first executive session. Where we'll begin we'll begin to vote on the specific line items in the governor's um, <coughs> budget. So uh, after we go through that, that, that process should wrap up by the end of May, and uh, with opportunity for action by both the assembly and the senate uh, in early June and uh, the governor should be able to sign a new budget by uh, the end of June. It's required statutorily that we have a new budget effective July 1st. Um, there's been times, I think my first uh, session in the legislature, uh, we did not have a new budget until October. Um, and uh, for those of you who might wonder what happens, uh, unlike the federal government who might shut down, we actually continue on current appropriations, current law, if that actually does happen. Don't anticipate that happening this time around. Some of the initiatives that the governor has in his budget, um, which I mean, you've probably been hearing uh, a lot of back and forth on, and you've heard legislators agree, disagree with different provisions. Uh, there will be significant changes. Uh, it always happens. So we uh, agree on a lot with Governor Walker, but we might have a, a variance of opinion on, a, on other issues, and uh, uh, oftentimes it's of local. Uh, local variation, local uh, things back home that might impact us and uh, motivate us. Uh, uh, my colleague Terry Kotsmas here, you know, perhaps issues in, in his area, you know, that are, are significant to him. He brings them to us, and then we uh, we, we we work towards uh, you know making changes. That's been actually an important uh, process, you know, especially for new legislators. Terry, this is his first budget he's going through. You know, there are um, 16 members on the Joint Finance Committee. Uh, in the uh, Democrats have four members, the Republicans being in the majority in both houses have 12 members. Uh, but in, in addition to that, our members of the uh, legislature who aren't on the committee, it's important for them to be engaged in the process, listening out in the public, and uh, be, have an opportunity to, to make change. So we have a process we call it Budget Buddies. Um, Terry's actually one of mine. So fortunate to be able to have him where we actually have weekly meetings and uh, gives them an opportunity to let us know what they're hearing back home uh, an opportunity for me to brief him on uh, you know what might be happening uh, in, in our discussions with the governor's office and, and the Senate as well so it's a very uh, it's a very important part of our process to make sure that all our members are engaged in what is what is taking place so some of the initiatives that the uh, uh, you might have heard about uh, you know work let's just talk about workforce development it, Initiatives uh, initially. Uh, currently, uh, unemployment was just announced uh, in the last couple of weeks that Wisconsin's unemployment rate is um, is down to 4.8 percent, which is great, uh, and it was at a high uh, back in 2010, uh, around 10 percent. Uh, my own area, I'm from the Marinette area. Uh, we were actually Marinette County was as high as 13 percent in the midst of the. Uh, uh, recession so uh, things are definitely headed in the right direction but we all realize that we still have a, a lot of work to do uh, the national average to, in perspective is at, is at 5.8 percent I'm sorry 5.5 percent uh, so workforce development initi initiatives are definitely an important part uh, some of the things that the governor has proposed uh, include a tech school te te uh, tech school freeze on tuition uh, in high need occupations 
He has proposed uh, changing the funding for tech, tech schools to a, uh, uh, we currently have 30% of the overall funding is in performance based. Uh, he's actually proposed to change it to 100%. Uh, financial aid, we maintain uh, the, fu the current funding for our financial aid in, in the budget. And uh, there's also a program uh, which is called Transform Milwaukee, which uh, was begun in the last session, where we in are investing an additional $5 million in, in preparing people, uh, specifically uh, in Milwaukee, but other areas as well. The, the, uh, these are called transitional jobs, people that are oftentimes, uh, uh, you know, could be out of prison, could be on our welfare programs, um, where they are subsidized jobs working through uh, uh, employers initially subsidized to get them to the point where uh, they can later uh, the sub subsidy goes away and, and allow for them to be to have some employment skills that will actually uh, help them uh, pay things such as child support not not rely on our welfare system uh, for themselves and their family and uh, that is a um, program that was begun last session and, and will be continued to be funded uh, this session. Uh, fast forward grants, uh, being from the Marinette area, I can tell you the shortage that we have in, in our state and, and most states have as far as a high, te high tech um, vo vocational programs, not always necessarily high tech, but uh, uh, just high demand, skilled trades, things, welders, pipe fitters, electricians. Uh, we definitely have a shortage nationally uh, and uh, there's opportunity for uh, grants uh, for those type of trainings. Uh, uh, in the Wisconsin Fast Forward program. Uh, continue, we also continue to uh, work with uh, uh, career planning uh, to assure that uh, children are getting the opportunity to identify opportunities for, for them. Uh, I think it's especially important uh, with the UW system and, and to be able to, when I, and I've had conversations with the, uh, the chancellor on this issue, when kids come into um, our UW system, of course, we don't want to tell them what, what they have to, you know, fields they have to go into, but I think it's important for them to understand uh, the amount of debt that's uh, um, possibly could be taking place by them going or getting a certain degree, but also the job skills um, that it might be needed for a certain uh, type of uh, career, and also what the job opportunities are uh, for that particular career so that they uh, have, a, have a true picture of what that choice might look like. Um, Wisconsin Works a program uh, which is uh, focused on reducing the time people are spending on our welfare programs in the governor's budget is, is uh, proposed to be reduced from 60 months to 48 months and uh, this goes back to uh, once again uh, helping people get to a point of uh, uh, reliance on work and preparing for work rather than reliance on government programs. Um, other things that might go along with that uh, you, that you've probably heard about, uh, it might be the proposal uh, dealing with drug testing uh, for welfare um, uh, programs. This is something uh, uh, the, the public, I can tell you it's one of the things I hear about a lot, is, is typically, of course not universally, but typically supportive of. Um, because most companies have to uh, have to drug test, so it's something that the public says people that are getting um, assistance should be as well. But the idea that the governor is proposing is to give people an opportunity to be actually be, be prepared for work, uh, because I, we're hearing from employers that one of the biggest obstacles to work is actually getting uh, people that can actually pass that drug test. So this is really about preparing them for a world of work. Uh, you, those that might know my history know I've actually done quite a bit of work on drug-related issues. Uh, I was talking with the mayor and the, and the county folks earlier about that. Um, I do believe it is important. Uh, I, I actually am supportive of this program, and some people might be surprised by that, but the, the key piece for me was when we had a conversation with the governor was that this wasn't just about a punitive approach. This needed to be uh, an opportunity for people to change their life and become employable and part of that process is going to would, would be uh, treatment rather than um, just the punitive side of cutting off benefits so uh, it is connected it is uh, funded uh, to provide some additional uh, treatment options for people when they do test positive on these programs that we can uh, work with them to be as I said become an asset and, and uh, paying into the system rather than draining the system so that's I think something that you'll, you'll probably hear a lot about a uh, number of states have uh, I think there's 12 states nationally have uh, taken similar approaches. Um, K-12 education, the governor's budget for the most part in the first year, uh, 
I think, I think it's also important when we're talking about K-12 public education to talk about how in the last budget, when the governor uh, initially proposed his budget, there was no increase for a public K-12 education. But at the uh, time that the budget was passed by both the uh, Assembly and the Senate, that uh, we had committed an additional $300 million to public education in Wisconsin. The governor's uh, first year of the budget, we had put a $75 per pupil categorical uh, aid, and the, the educational folks will know what that means. A lot of other people probably won't, but the, our concern was oftentimes the way the funding formula works in our state, the dollars don't necessarily get to where they need to get. <laughs> Um, because of you know the way the values work uh, statewide, but with this categorical aid went to every single pupil in the state of Wisconsin uh, to assure that uh, they were getting the, uh, the the appropriate levels of funding. So seventy-five dollars in the first year, seventy-five dollars in the second year. So it would have been one hundred and fifty dollars in the base year of this budget. Uh, in the first year, uh, the governor took that out, and in the second year, he put it back in. So that is, as I was talking at our table, that's probably our biggest priority uh, in the uh, Assembly uh, Republican Caucus to restore, I believe it's about $119 million, the estimates are now, um, to the first year of the budget to at least leave uh, public schools uh, flat uh, over the, the two years. I believe that at the end of the day, there will actually will be an increase in, uh, in K-12 funding, but you know, uh, there's, some, there's some hurdles we have to pass before we get to that point. Um, and then uh, also speaking about education, the governor uh, has a proposal dealing with the UW system uh, where he, uh, he proposed uh, a authority, a public authority, which basically would spin the UW system off, uh, give them the opportunity to be autonomous from the uh, state legislature. Uh, this is actually an idea that uh, former uh, chancellor of <coughs> UW-Madison proposed, I believe it was four years ago. Uh, I, I don't think that's very likely. Uh, I don't think that there has been, the, co the conversations have not been necessarily positive, either, either from within the UW system or from uh, um, the public regarding the, or, or my colleagues in the, in the legislature about giving the UW system that type level of authority. The idea behind the authority was at the same time we were going to be making some budget reductions. It's $300 million is what's proposed, and that's a big number, and it's gotten a lot of attention. But I think something needs to be, keep, uh, be talked about also. This is not a, a discussion that's unique to Wisconsin. Um, actually, if you look nationally uh, over the last uh, eight years uh, during the recession and, and since, and since uh, the commitment for um, public universities at, its, at the state level has gone down dramatically. Actually, Wisconsin is in the, about the lower third of the 50 states as far as the amount of reductions that we've seen uh, in, in investment in public uh, universities. Obviously, a $300 million uh, reduction would make a significant uh, dent in, in that. Um, the Board of Regents in, is uh, actually wrestling with this issue right now. Uh, they put out a proposal yesterday dealing with out-of-state tuition. Uh, the concept of out of state, raising out-of-state tuition, I think some background uh, needs to be discussed there. So um, Wisconsin actually, when you compare us, UW-Madison, for example, is 11th in the Big Ten as far as our, our, our tuition, and our out-of-state tuition is equally, e equally low, and our comprehensive universities as compared to our neighbors, Minnesota, Illinois, um, Michigan, the comprehensive universities are relatively low as well. If, if uh, in a, in a time of when budgets are tight, if we're going to be looking for reductions or possibly new revenues, I think it's our goal to keep tuition for in-state residents low. Um, and so by maybe raising the bar a little bit or what we expect from people who are sending their kids from out of state uh, into, our, into our UW system, uh, I think that's actually a reasonable discussion that we, that we should have. Um, because first and foremost, it has to be about our kids getting a, a you know a affordable quality education in our, in our UW system. So, um, it actually with reciprocity for Minnesota, for example, it's actually um, cheaper for somebody from Minnesota to send their child to a UW school than it is for them to educate them in, in Minnesota. That's not fair to our taxpayers. So we need to we, we need to try and level that field out a little bit. So I mean I, I think you're going to be hearing a little bit about that over the next few weeks. Um, in addition to the UW, there's also a two-year tuition freeze proposed in the governor's budget uh, for Wisconsin, um, for our Wisconsin schools and our Wisconsin students. Also, in, uh, to keep in part of the discussion is is the it installed all not even. Uh, I'm actually a product of a, a, a two-year 
uh, UW College uh, in Marinette. We have one in my hometown. Uh, all is not even, but when you look perhaps maybe back uh, two years ago, there was a lot of discussion about reserves at the UW system. Uh, I was talking to one of our, our CPAs earlier. I have a, col a group of colleagues, we call them the CPA Caucus, who discovered that there was about $1.3 billion in reserves. Uh, in the UW system, and that was during a period of time where um, there was a lot of focus on their finances or there were uh, a few cries about not having enough money, uh, where they had built up this $1.3 billion of reserves. Even though we froze tuition two years ago and also required them to invest in, in certain initiatives rather than in state filling it with GPR, uh, filling those, uh, funding those initiatives with GPR, those reserves have actually continued to either stay the same or grow. Um, and, uh, but as I was saying, all is not equal. Uh, you've got a UW Sheboygan County, I believe in this area. Uh, I have UW Marinette, uh, there's uh, campuses throughout the whole state. Uh, the UW colleges are a very affordable uh, way to educate our ch uh, kids, especially as an entry point. Uh, um, something I'll be looking at in the next, next couple of years with a, a high, high school junior. But uh, so all is not equal and I, I think it's our interest to try and at least work with the Board of Regents and the leaders of the UW system to pr try and help those that don't have the resources be able to weather any type of reductions in, in funding that, that might take place. Uh, another initiative uh, that has gotten a lot of attention is uh, the uh, IRIS and family care uh, proposal. Uh, the proposal, actually the proposal in the governor's budget does not have a lot of detail to it and because of that I don't think it's going to be proposed or be passed as is. Uh, but one of the challenges we do face, and as I've talked to a lot of disabled and you know elderly folks over the last few weeks, one of the challenges we face as a state and as a, as a nation quite honestly is that the baby boomers are retiring, the number of people in uh, our, on our retirement programs over the next 10 to 20 years is going gonna, is gonna to explode. It's going to explode, and the, the question is, how do we how do we pay for that when there's fewer can be fewer people working? So I think it's our responsibility as fiscal or, uh, leaders of the state of Wisconsin to at least look for potential uh, opportunities to, uh, to to reform and to save money to assure that those programs are there when people actually need them in the future, not just not just today. So I, I think while the there's not enough meat on the bone today as far as the IRIS and family care proposals, I, I do think it's quite likely that we'll um, tell, tell the Department of Health Services to sit down with the stakeholder groups and have a conversation about what these programs could look like, get their input, uh, go to the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, which is required uh, to make any changes, and come back to us with a proposal that we actually all understand, not just us as legislators, but the public understands too, so that we can at least have a dialogue that is, is comes from a standpoint of being informed rather than um, you know trust us on, on this proposal I don't think any of us are elected uh, based on trust us so I, I think we're going to have uh, um, that discussion for over the next few months um, in addition to that uh, transportation I mean, I mean you just go back here senior care uh, is, is also gotten a lot of attention. Senior care is a prescription drug program in Wisconsin. We are the only state in the nation that actually has a state-based uh, prescription drug program. Uh, it's pretty, as I said, pretty unique. Um, but the, under the governor's proposal, he proposes using it a, uh, as a um, backfill for the uh, prescription, uh, pres um, prescription D, Medicare Part D program. And uh, the legislature, as it's been discussed over the last few weeks, my colleagues included, uh, have stepped up and said, you know what, uh, this, is, this is unique. Perhaps maybe we could look at reforms uh, that uh, can reduce the costs uh, for Wisconsin residents, but let's not uh, just throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's look at ways to, uh, um, to improve it, but try and maintain it. So I think that's probably going to happen as well. Uh, transportation, I know, is a big issue here. We were talking earlier about uh, Highway LS. It was one of our my uh, uh, best memories of the last budget. And if you want to know about it, I'll, I'll tell you later. Uh, ask me later. I can tell you a little private joke there. But um, the funding as proposed in the governor's budget for transportation is, uh, while it is laudable that the amount of bonding in this budget is actually probably about a 20-year low for the overall bonding. The governor relies on 1.3 billion of bonding in the transportation fund. We do have a challenge here, and this is the more we talk about this, I think the better it's, it's gonna be for the public to understand. We do have a challenge here with cars becoming more fuel efficient, 
Um, we basically fund our, our transportation through registration fees and gas tax. As cars become more fuel efficient, the amount of money coming into the system is going down. Well, we know that the costs are not going down, the costs are going up. So we have about a $600 million um, uh, hole that we need to, to f come up with a solution on how to pay for that. The governor's solution was rather than any new taxes or any new fees, uh, was to use bonding, which bonding's low right now, it's cheap, but I guess our, a lot of our colleagues, Terry included, is it may not be cheap two years from now, so let's at least begin to have the conversation about how we're gonna deal with this uh, problem moving forward. Uh, we're gonna put some proposals out there uh, on how to deal with it, we'll see where they go, but at least I think it's important for the public to know um, what's going on and uh, so that you can actually begin to weigh in as well about what makes sense uh, for the uh, future infrastructure of the state of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Uh, it is our goal, and for the county folks out there and those concerned about Highway 23, which is on the docket, it is our goal to not r cut projects, but it's early in the, it's early in the discussions right now. It's, it's our goal not to reduce, cut projects, uh, but to do that, we either need to rely on the $1.3 billion of bonding that the governor's proposed or find alternatives to fund um, the shortfall that we have in, in the transportation system. So um, with that, I actually think I took longer than I, was, uh, I said I would, but I think the important part of this dialogue is to be able to answer any questions that you might have uh, about the proposed state budget. So I'll open it up to questions. They told me a half hour, I said, I can't talk for that long, and I probably ended up talking for over 20, didn't I? I did. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, I'd like to follow up on your um, the UW yeah. uh, cuts and and just a full disclosure, part of our UW Shook Wagon Foundation and the UW Board of Visitors, so mm -hmm. of a vested interest. But, um, As we all do, yeah, really. I mean, I think most people would agree that the UW system, the UW colleges, the extension, are probably as lead as any part of the UW system. They're most closely aligned with our counties. We have great partnerships here in Shook Wagon County, you probably heard. Um, the county and business interests have combined to build a new engineering building. The faculty staff are, are paid lower than any comparable in the UW system, let alone uh, school districts and technical <coughs> colleges, none of which has been corrected by the Board of Regents. Um, and you have, and, and it's, it's the closest thing to the local community, the best instructor student ratio in all of secondary edu higher education. So, given that, would, is there any consideration to saying, um, we're exempting the UW colleges as an extension from any cuts. Those cuts have to come in the other areas where they have more ability to, to, to uh, cushion that, plus they have third-party income sources that aren't available at the UW colleges. That conversation has taken place. I will say I've got proposals from some of my members to do that very same thing. How, uh, and uh, as I said, I mean, full discussion. First of all, I said I, you know, I think we all have vested interest in whether it be the colleges or UW system, just education as a whole. But I mean, I'm, I'm a product. I have one in, uh, at a campus in, in Marinette as well, um, and I agree with you. I think it, I don't think there's a lot of fat there. Um, my concern, uh, I don't know that it's beneficial for any of us as legislators to, for the body as a whole to begin saying to UW. Uh, don't cut here, cut here, because what it ends up being is it ends up being, you know, I'm from Marinette, I'll protect my own, right? You know, I, I think that might be potentially dangerous, but as I said earlier, I think the conversation needs to take place uh, with the um, Board of Regents and with the, uh, the uh, President Cross uh, on what makes sense, and this just can't be an across, the, if there's gonna be reductions. Uh, by the way, the proposal to raise out-of-state tuition, uh, they, have a, they have a number um, in, the Board of Regents is like, I believe, $63 million it could raise over the two-year biennium. Uh, in Fiscal Bureau, who works, as I said, works for us, they work, they're the Legislative Fiscal Bureau, they're asked, and are widely respected, at, you know, for what they do, their estimate is $91 million over the biennium. So if we go down that road, that's, there's a potential to reduce that cut by almost a third. Um, with what I would consider potentially a very reasonable step. As I said earlier, it shouldn't be cheaper for kids to, from Minnesota to send their kids here than it is to educate them in their own state. Um, I share your concern, and uh, as I said, that proposal is out there. I, just, I question if we get to that point whether it's going to come down to political arm wrestling uh, rather than uh, you know, doing what's right for the overall system. So. 
Yes, sir. Just a general uh, uh, question. Um, I think I know the answer, but I'm not sure. Um, the process begins you know, with, with the governor mm -hmm. making a, a, a proposal. Are, is the legislature, you know, the House, um, you know o uh, only allowed to react you know, to his uh, recommendations, or can you? Uh, we could propose our own budget. You can. We could propose our own budget. Okay, I thought that was the answer, but I wasn't. Yeah, um, I don't think that will happen. I mean, because the governor of the state of Wisconsin has a very powerful uh, veto uh, pen. And I mean, as a, as a basic, I mean, there's things we disagree with, you know, there's things we disagree with. But I think 90% of it, you know, is probably going to remain as is. You know, I mean, you, you were talking about probably the top eight, 10 things. You know, that gets a lot of attention. There's thousands of other, it's a 1,700 page document. There's thousands of other things that will be, will be passed, you know, pretty much unanimously. So we have that potential, but to basically start over, I don't, I don't think is, is realistic. But there is one important thing that I think I, I haven't mentioned, but it's important for people to know. So based on the fact that we're, you know, we're not necessarily putting new dollars into the, the K-12 uh, in the first year, uh, UW cuts, those t t things along those lines, people would think, well, your revenues are low. Our revenues have never been higher in the state of Wisconsin, never been higher. And that's after we, we did reduce taxes by about $2 billion last, last uh, budget. But, and, and in my view, when, it's, when we have an abundance of cash, you have one of two things that you could do. You can, either, um, you can either fund other things, create new programs that are, you're gonna have to fund in the next budget, or you can give it back to the people because it's their money to begin with. And my principle is, it's your money, you're, you, it should go back to you. If we might need uh, additional dollars in the future, that, that discussion should take place. Um, but there's, there's one single thing that um, people need to understand, it goes back to kind of that discussion about Iris Family Care uh, that, w that we had earlier, is over the last three budgets that I've been a part of, we put nearly, I think it's $2.7 billion of new money into Medicaid programs um, because of the, the growth and the, the expense in, in dealing with, with our Medicaid programs. Um, now, some might say, well, you should take the federal money that the federal government's promised uh, to fund that. Okay. The reason we have had to put $2.7 billion of new money into it is because the federal government has stepped away from their commitments in a lot of those cases. When I first began, it's a, Medicaid is a, f a state and federal partnership where the, when I first started, they were funding about 70 cents on the dollar. It's now down to 58 cents on the dollar uh, that the federal government is funding. We, have, we will have a balanced budget when this budget becomes law. We know what's happened at the federal government. The reliance on those dollars, folks, is, is not secure. And if we, w we cannot put our taxpayers at risk by relying on those dollars. And because of that, you know, moving forward, you know, we're gonna make the tough decisions, but I just wanna be clear, it's not because we have a lack of revenue. We have a lot of revenue. Can you have a question? Um, transportation, what's your take on what will ultimately happen to raise funds for the transportation department? Um, it really, we're going to put together a menu of opportunity um, for people to look at. So on a per mile, I was just reading these the statistics yesterday, on a per mile, if you look at it as a per mile, what, it, what does it cost somebody in Wisconsin to drive per mile? Um, we, have a ver we have the highest gas tax, I believe, in the Midwest, um, one of the highest in the nation. Um, I think it's in the top 13 or so in the, in, in the, uh, in the nation. So you would think that because of that, we are probably high nationally as far, or at least in the Midwest, as far as how much we're already paying for from a transportation system. We are actually the lowest in the Midwest because our registration fee is lower, um, other fees are lower, um, other states have other ways of, you know, taking dollars from you to fund transportation. So, I mean, I think that needs to be considered as well as we have these discussions. Our registration fee, which is $75 right now, is the lowest in the Midwest. Uh, if we raise that by $25, that would be $86 million a year uh, that could go into transportation. Um, if you know, there's people that support raising the gas tax, I, don't, I believe that's fairly unlikely uh, that that will happen just because it, it goes back to the same problem I talked about. We could raise the gas tax and it, couldn't be, it would not necessarily be a, a, a source that would be continuing to grow over a period of time, it would be declining. Um, there's proposals to, you know, assure that, you know, uh, as we have more electric vehicles on the road, that they're paying a, a fee towards them as well, 
which I, which I think is fair. If you use it, you should pay for it, but that's a very low amount. Um, so, I mean, there, there's a, a number of proposals that are, are out there. I think the registration fee is probably one of the most likely. I do not anticipate that we will be able to tackle the whole $600 million shortfall in one budget. I think it'll probably be a, a couple budget uh, process before we get there. And that's considering the governor has said no to any, any uh, tax and fee increases. So if, if we do do that, we're going to have to, you know, arm wrestle a little bit with the governor at the end of the day. Luke. As we talked at the table, uh, you know, first of all, the fact that uh, the last budget did uh, have increases for school districts per student of $75 and then another $75, it, it, the, the fact that we're looking at pulling that out would, would really suggest that wasn't needed in the past. And uh, my view would be, uh, although a lot of people in this room may disagree, I think Act 10 did a lot of good to maybe take waste and, and the, not, the balance of public versus private benefits, that whole issue out of the out of our costs relative to schools. But at the same time, we're privately investing in schools. Industry and, and individuals in this county are investing in, in projects to improve our school systems, and they're doing it because there's no other source of revenue to do it. And to have a situation where we now cut back the support of schools, uh, uh, it just seems to be incongruent with uh, number one, what even the governor is trying to do by by preparing students uh, to move forward out of the education system and be a benefit to our, our local areas. Uh, at the same time, I think the school systems, particularly in this area, are doing a good job of controlling costs. And, and yet we all know, just as you were speaking about the highway program a moment ago, some costs are going up. So yep. I would really like to think that the education part of the budget is not only going to, as you suggest, get rid of the decrease, but provide some manner for the uh, school systems to get additional funds. I think the guy at the table would tell you, based on caucus discussions, it's the number one priority. It's, uh, like, as I said last time, the governor had no increase last time, and we were, the uh, caucuses are the ones that put it in. Uh, I anticipate the same thing will happen again. Um, you know, I mean, one thing one to be, I want to make sure people understand. Though, I mean, here here's the the arm. First of all, my, my wife's a public school teacher, and uh, as a legislator, uh, I also was affected by Act Ten. Uh, so both of us were. But I do but agree with you. Uh, it put more of a balance. It put it empowered school boards to make decisions that were right for them, um, rather than you know giving uh, giving the power away. Um, but just remember, uh, it's not public folks stepping up. Uh, to help with programs and, pro and products projects that's laudable I think it, and it's great but there is another alternative and that's to make to uh, get the public behind it and that there because there are opportunities for if, if you don't, if you don't uh, have the opportunity you can go to referendum and oftentimes school districts say well people the public won't support that well the public is who sends us there too so <laughs> You know, we're under that same microscope of, of having to make decisions and, and, and from a funding standpoint. So it, it, it's a pull. It's, you know, it's a tug of war that goes on uh, that we have to be able to um, do our best to be able to make decisions that, that will help. And I, I think we're going to do that. Um, but I, understand I, can't, I can't necessarily tell you why the governor made the, put the proposal he did to, I just on think table. you should also understand that it isn't just the so-called educators in this room or, or in the base that are thinking that education is important and that it is important for us to continue to fund it at a, an appropriate level. The reason K-12 gets got funded with $300 million extra last time and the way reason will probably get funded again this time with additional revenues is because it's important to our, and my colleagues and that's because it's important to the people that sent them there regardless of whether you're an educator or whether you're a mom raising, you know, three kids right now, you know, it's a, it, it's just a basic priority in our state. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, I want to follow up on, on, on what Lou said just briefly. It's more of a comment than a question, but we're spending an awful lot of money downstream on jobs initiatives and workforce, and I love it. That's great. I work in higher education, by the way. But we're spending all that money downstream. We got to spend it upstream. We have to spend it in pre-K through 12 so we don't have to spend as much downstream. I work at a college and the preparation level- Wait, Which one do you work? I work at Lakeland College. Okay. And the preparation level is becoming challenging when schools cannot teach like they used to be able to do. 
Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin used to be known for their public education systems, and we're getting beat up here in Wisconsin. So please, put it back into pre-K through 12. It's going to help everybody. I we'll spend less money on social services down the road. Just want to be clear, though. I mean, and then I, I couldn't agree. First of all, uh, one of my colleagues, Dale Toynga, is a graduate of Lakeland, played on your basketball team. He's on the Joint Finance Committee with me. Um, I'll tell him you said hello. It's not that Wisconsin doesn't prioritize education, as I was sharing at the table earlier. Uh, we wrote, it goes back and forth, but for the most part, we're number one ish in the Midwest as far as per pupil education dollars per pupil that we spend, uh, and 15th nationally. So it's not that we don't prioritize it, but when budgets are tight, the governor had to make some tough decisions. I think the legislature, when we probably see some new revenues in May, because uh, things are looking pretty good, we're going to you know, basically step in where he, he did not. Yes, sir. Suggestion. Well, how about just removing <coughs> the word net and that new construction? Because that would really help, especially some of the older, uh, mid to large size cities. Uh, right now, we have a community <coughs> building, uh, two buildings, which is going to add to my tax base. But I lost the yeah, subtract the anything you tear down from it. Yeah. Right? So I'm, I'm wondering if that might be something the legislature could consider in, in that, not having to move any tax uh, caps, but, but just give us a little bit of room. Uh, under that They've come to me and talked to me about that. I mean, I think that's something that's on the on the docket is for us to consider. Another thing that for us to consider is um, um, the you, the lose it or lose it. In other words, if you uh, le don't levy to the max one year, um, say you save a couple percentage points, uh, tenths of a percent, uh, that maybe the next year you're able to when when uh, demands are different, you might be able to go back and, and uh, use what you didn't lose or use the, la the first time. I mean, I think that. The, the use it or lose it uh, mentality, probably almost everybody uses it. <laughs> the, that's, the motivation is to use it. So if we can find ways to uh, incentivize uh, other type of behavior that you can l then later uh, tap into, I think that's good. So we're, we're looking for ideas like that. There's other ideas that are out there, uh, which politically we got to work through the system, but there's other ideas about possibly uh, local um, local sales tax potential um, through referendum to give local communities that want to uh, fund certain things that opportunity. Um, but these are only proposals. Uh, it's going to take a lot of uh, arm wrestling before we get to that point. Just but, consider removing that one Yep. Word. The county association has been in and talked to me about it. <laughs> yes, sir, in the back. We recently had a local heads of government meeting with the city, towns, and villages uh, heads there in Congress. And um, the primary problem we have is our transportation needs. And uh, Mayor Vanderstein spoke to the levy limits, if there could be some adjustments there. And also, there's a prevailing wage that uh, hits us pretty hard with any project uh, that we have on our roads over $100,000. It used to be a higher cap if that could be adjusted or better yet, eliminate the prevailing wage would be a great savings with no. I'm, I'm not familiar with the higher cap. It actually used to be a lower cap. Uh, we actually repealed the lower cap when we uh, came in in 2011. I'm not familiar with it. Maybe it was, but um, there's discussions going on about prevailing wage right now. I will say my position is, so for me to be able to get a, pa a budget passed, um, I need uh, 51 votes, and there are 50 votes in the assembly, um, and my goal is to have all 63 of my Republican colleagues vote yes. Um, my goal is to make things less uh, divisive, not more divisive. Uh, prevailing wage is one of those issues that can be uh, if, if for a complete repeal. However, if we can look for things in the, in the uh, t changes that we can make in the budget uh, from a reform standpoint, I, I'm, in, I'm supportive of that. How, and at the same time, there is a bill that's running through the legislature to completely repeal uh, prevailing wage, let that bill have its day, uh, have its hearings, have its debate, and go through that process. But I guess what I'm saying is I'm supportive of what you're saying. I just don't see the state budget as the vehicle to do that. Possible reforms, yes. Repeal, no. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm John Ross with Hearthstone, Wisconsin. We are a self-help and advocacy group for people with disabilities. And I was heartened to hear that you're considering 
taking the portion, the governor's portion uh, of the budget out uh, for further debate with family services, long-term care. I, yeah. Does joint finance have that um, power to actually remove that section of the budget so that it can be? We do. However, I don't, I, I, just to be clear, I don't think I said removed. I think what we're, and, and some of my colleagues, and Terry was probably in the last meeting, where I, I don't think we know enough to say yes at this point in time, but at the same time, as I said, with the, with the pressures on our budget because of Medicaid and long-term care costs in the future, I don't know that we know enough to say no either. So if there's the potential, and some of my colleagues were teasing me about riding the fence there, but if, if the uh, potential is that we could save money down the road, I think we should at least have those discussions. So I, what I see happening is us saying to the Department of Health Services, sit down with the stakeholder groups, the elderly services, the disabled communities, have those discussions, go to CMS, because pretty much everything that we, if we're gonna make changes, CMS needs to say yes to it too. Um, go to them and then come back to us with what the plan actually is gonna look like, and then we can make a decision whether it makes sense or not. So our goal is to at least have those groups at the table um, having discussions so that uh, we all can, we all may not get what we want, but at least we can have a dialogue to help better understand why we're, why we're going the direction we're going. And this would be done before June 1st? Oh, no. No. Well, the, that initiative, I, I see that, that's our response in the budget to the, uh, the question that was put before us. So what I would see happening is that we would say, no, but go do this, this, and this, come back to us, and I probably think that would probably be a year or so down the road before they can actually have those conversations with CMS and others, and then let us know what the, the idea is, what it, what it really looks like, and hopefully build support uh, from the uh, disabled and elderly communities before we move forward. All right, thank you. You bet. Yes, ma'am. I'm real happy to hear that there's a focus on K-12 education. That, that, that's a very good thing. But I would also ask that you, if that money comes back in, that you also keep an eye on the policy that's put into the budget that has the unintended consequences, such as the course options law that was put in last year. Um, that in and of itself would have increased the um, amount of money that we would have had to pay in the Plymouth School District close to $100,000. And um, so you bring the money back, but the unfunded mandates that go in um, sometimes are sort of like, you know, they, they don't balance out. So I would just ask that you keep an eye on those types of things and make sure that they don't hit us, you know, like a double whammy that way. Mm -hmm. no, no really additional comment there. Five okay, so I got five minutes. <coughs> Nobody else? Well, what is, exactly is the timeline of making a decision on the transportation plan? Will that decision be made by you, by you, like you said, whether it be a bonding, whether it be yes. uh, Transportation funding decisions will typically be made um, by final passage of joint finance and then go to the floor. So what we decide in joint finance typically is pretty close to the final bill. Uh, the, the two floors, Assembly and Senate, have the opportunity to make changes through amendment, but for the most part, I mean, there might be subtle changes, but nothing significant typically. Um, and then the governor has, as I said earlier, a very powerful veto pen in our state. We have the opportunity to override vetoes. Um, you know, after that might be done, but uh, joint finance done in May, end of May, action in the flo on the uh, assembly and Senate floor sometime in early June with the goal of being passed, assigned into law by the governor by the end of June. And all those decisions need to be made by then. You know, just thinking a little bit about the transportation bill, uh, you're probably aware that Highway 23 has been jacked around for the last 30 or 35 years relative to when that, pro uh, that highway was going to be improved, and, you know, even if there's going to be a reduction in it, is there any uh, thought given to projects that just seem to be continually and continually delayed versus other projects? How is that divided up, and who makes that decision? Typically, that those decisions are made by the Department of Transportation rather than, it kind of goes back to what I said earlier, if you want legislators making decisions about what projects are going to get moved around, uh, it comes down to who's got, you know, more clout than the other, and I, I think t decisions need to be made based on, doesn't say that will never happen, uh, because I actually, there was a portion of Highway 23, I remember a few years it got moved up. Um, I think it was in my, my first budget, a portion of it got moved up, I see some head shaking, and that was done through with the political process. Um, so the potential does exist, but if, if you rely on it to happen that way, 
it comes down to who can you know who's got the most clout and I think giving the you know the 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 current system to be able to work I think that that makes the most most sense I don't and as I said earlier and Terry might disagree but I, I don't see the goal of any of our legislators to cut projects I, I see it as, as our solution um, you know we've looked we look for fat with DOT don't believe don't get me wrong um, and you know I know people don't like certain things around you know I hear all the or, you know, concern about roundabouts and all that. I mean, I, either you love them or hate them, whatever. Uh, that you know, that's up to individual people. Um, we we've done away with things like all the stamped concrete and all the wrought iron and all that. You know, community. Uh, I forget what that program was called. Somebody help me. It was community community options or something was like that in transportation where it was to get the community involved in the process of design. You know, Green Bay might have cattails on their uh, you know overpasses. It's all nice, but at the end of the day, it comes down to safe design of our, our transportation system, not how pretty it looks. So we're looking for things to reduce like that, uh, but at the end of the day, I don't see that uh, reducing projects is, is the way for us to balance our, uh, our transportation shortfall that we're going to have over the next 10 years. Yes, sir? You mentioned earlier that Wisconsin has more revenues than ever. Yes. Just clarify for me then why the other statements, not necessarily from you, but all the media about we have no choice but to cut this and this shortfall and this and that. It's because based on projections of revenue, the costs are higher than the revenues. And uh, those can change from day to day. Um, as a matter of fact, there was a discussion a few weeks ago about uh, we might end this current budget with a, a shortfall. Um, the projections I've seen right now. Um, that won't happen. We'll actually end up with a surplus. So I mean, it, it changes from from day to day um, based on revenue collections. So um, and the thing that's driving the costs uh, over the last three budgets has been Medicaid. Uh, this budget it's uh, requiring about seven hundred million dollars of more money, of new money to be put into the Medicaid program to be able to balance. So I, I do we do anticipate that come May, beginning of May, when the new revenue estimates come out, that we'll have additional revenues. Um, to be able to um, make some changes, things like education and others. One last quick question. Yes, sir. Easy one. Um, <laughs> I don't remember, but does this budget include money for the Bucks new home? Or so that I brought it up earlier, didn't I? Uh, things that might be controversial, maybe I did just sit at my table. Um, <laughs> yeah, it does. Uh, the governor's proposal was to give. Uh, and it's quite, this is, these arena issues are always terrible in every state, every local municipality that they come up in. Um, he proposed using the growth in player salaries uh, to help pay for a bond that the state of Wisconsin would, would um, give on behalf of the, uh, the team for $220 million. There's some basic things that need to be understood about that. First of all, I, I think most of my colleagues and I thought that was a too high a number, but there's some basic things that need to be understood. First of all, um, the Bucks, if they leave, uh, we lose hundreds of million dollars into the city of Milwaukee and tens of millions of dollars in actually player salaries and other type of uh, state incomes. Okay, so the team leaving has a cost as well. In addition to that, the legislature and decision makers back in the 80s when they built the Bradley Center. Uh, it is owned by the state of Wisconsin. So if the team leaves, uh, we have, you know, that's why you might see political commercials over the years about somebody voting for a new scoreboard for the Bradley Center. It's because the state owns it. So if the team leaves, uh, we will have no tenant. Uh, it has deferred maintenance of about $100 million. Uh, the actual, and they're a little bit of debt. So about $120 million uh, would be the number that's estimated that if we, if we did nothing and the team left. So my colleagues and I are saying, okay, there is a cost of doing nothing, and that's the team leaving and then being stuck with this empty building. So we've said, let's look for other options. We're, we're proposing $150 million using that same funding formula um, in only new player salaries to be able to pay for it. And, uh, but we've also been able to find another funding source that the uh, interest rate paid would go down by a couple percentage points and uh, save the state uh, you know, tens of hundreds of millions of dollars in interest over the life of a life alone. We also reduce the, the bond term from 30 years to 20 years. So we're heading in the right direction, but I think people just need to understand there is a cost of doing nothing um, by, the, by the team leaving, and it's real. 
Um, it is, is a, this is not the Green Bay Packers who will never leave the city of Green Bay. Okay? The NBA has two potential sites that will pay the value, and once the t- team leaves, the value of the team will basically double. Seattle and Las Vegas. The team will leave if we do nothing. So that's where, you know, I, I, I don't like it. I'm from north of Green Bay. <laughs> I don't like it, but when Mercury Marine was talking about leaving and the economic impact to our state, we stepped up and provided some assistance to be able to keep them here. I would kind of relate a similar uh, concern needs to be uh, considered when we're talking about the Bucks leaving the state of Wisconsin. Leadership sucks sometimes. <laughs> Thank you. And because we're all interested in getting to have um, ear bending time, um, Senator Lemihu and Representative Vorpagel will be um, available for listening sessions on April 13th in Howard's Grove from 4 to 5 p.m. And then on Friday, April 17th, at the Keel listening session um, from 11.30 a.m. to 12.30. And even better is we have Representative Terry Katzma with us today, and uh, so you can bend his ear for just a few seconds. But otherwise, he will be tomorrow in Random Lake at the library at 10 a.m. for 40 minutes, and then again at Cedar Grove Library at 11 a.m. for 40 minutes. And Representative Terry Katzma, we would also like to thank you for coming today. And Representative John Nygren, thank you so much for your time. Um, Just so everybody knows, um, on April 15th, we have a couple really cool things going on, but the two that I'm going to focus on right now are our focal point, where what the hashtag, uh, social media trends, and what they mean to your business um, event. And then uh, the business after hours will be at Spaceport Sheboygan. I uh, I I invite you to go and and check it out. Um, May 6th is our Next Wave Young Professionals Awards Night. Um, and that's a Wednesday. Um, and then our next Friday forum is not going to be the first Friday forum. It seems to be a theme we're going to go through in 2015. It's going to be our second Friday forum um, because we are so excited. We're going to have the Marine Sanctuary update and benefits are going to be here. So we will be here, but it'll be May 8th, not May 1st. So I hope you all have a wonderful April. And you know, if you're not doing on anything on April 20th, it's my birthday, so you can wish me happy birthday. But otherwise, you guys have a great month. Thanks so much.